Hello, hello. It's Osman Parvez with the House Einstein Podcast. This is House Einstein Podcast 22. And with me is Hamish Crab. Hello, hello. Welcome to the House Einstein Podcast. And for those that are joining us for the first time, I am the founder of House Einstein, a real estate brokerage based in Boulder, Colorado. And we do business in Boulder, in Denver. Uh, we also go north of Boulder and into the suburbs. Uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily call them suburbs. Satellite cities, the affectionately known L's. And we are even now doing deals in the mountain towns. Um, but we are based here in Boulder. And our goal in these podcasts are to give you a sneak peek, give you a, a, a peek behind the, the curtain of real estate, what you probably don't get from your real estate agent, what you might not hear from uh, the popular marketing you'll get online and social media. Um, after 20 years in this industry, well, we've learned a few things. And the goal is to help share some of what we've learned with you and hopefully educate and entertain you along the way. Now, with that said, I have to give out a little bit of a disclaimer. And that is, if you are a client of House Einstein, please contact your House Einstein agent directly for information regarding your real estate deal. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to us. We are here for you as your agents. If you are not a House Einstein client, um, and even if you are a client listening to this, you should best consider this podcast as entertainment and uh, leave it at that. So if you take real estate, if you make real estate decisions or real, uh, decisions that affect your financial or psychological well-being on the basis of this podcast, don't come looking for us if things <laughs> don't go right. <laughs> You're not our client and this podcast is entertainment. Um, all right. With that said, that keeps the attorneys happy. And we've done the bio. Well, we haven't done our bios. So let me do a quick bio. I've been doing this for 20 years prior to real estate, um, actually more than 20 years. And prior to real estate, I and during real estate at various points, uh, when I began this journey into the real estate profession, I also worked as a, a financial analyst and an associate at an investment firm in their capital markets group um, as an a brief period as an economic consultant uh, with an economic consulting company in Boston. And so my, my prior education before I devoted 20 years of my life to the real estate profession was very much related to due diligence and fiduciary responsibility to advising clients, uh, sometimes institutional investors, sometimes private clients. Um, and somehow I stumbled into real estate and I've been here doing real estate for a long time in Boulder. But what we share, um, is often applicable not just to the Colorado real estate markets, but also to real estate in general across the country. With that said, one more disclaimer, real estate <laughs> is usually regulated at the state level. Uh, and I don't know if that's true for every state, but it's true for every state I've ever worked in. And um, the, the legal side of contracts or other stuff we might discuss may not apply to your home state. So again, talk to your real estate agent that you trust before you make any decisions. And if you're looking for representation or advice here in Colorado, reach out to us. You'll find us at houseeinstein.com. Nice. All right. Did I cover it? Was it concise? I think you nailed it. Yeah. Okay. Don't want to <laughs> labor on uh, and, and bore y'all while you're listening to this podcast. Um, in this podcast, these are the topics we intend to cover. We're going to talk about market conditions particularly market conditions as we move into the fourth quarter. We're also going to talk about the importance of pricing a listing correctly and some of the nuances to pricing listings. And if you're considering hiring a listing agent, some of the stuff that you may want to ask, and we've devoted a whole podcast to questions, but as we uh, continue to work in the industry, sometimes we run into very interesting and unique situations and uh, we'll share a story related to that today. We are planning to talk a little bit about title work and surveys as part of the due diligence that buyers need to consider doing and sellers should be prepared for buyers to do. And then we'll wrap it up with a little bit of discussion on the importance of teamwork in real estate. Great. How's that sound, Hamish? It sounds like we'll, I think we'll get through it all. 
Yeah. Uh, I th yeah. Some of these could be a relatively small discussion and other ones knowing us, we could go down a bit of a rabbit hole. Yep. All for the and name of entertainment. And we did skip a little bit of your bio. Do you want to tell us? I, yeah, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Um, I've been with House Einstein, I think coming on 18 months now. And in that time I've been exposed to a plethora of deals. Um, and rapidly gained a decent amount of experience. Prior to that, I was in uh, the collect car scene with classic BMWs and um, custom modifications and also content creation across social media. So I uh, bring an uh, interesting perspective and also have a decent amount of experience in, um, I think it would be the best way to describe it would be like collectible or unusual <laughs> properties you know like um the, it's similar and not not nowhere near the same but when you're valuing a property or valuing uh, a specific collector car there's different factors that come into play so there's a bit of uh, trade-off there too or sure. a crossover yeah i mean i so just for a point of reference the average agent here in colorado does fewer than four deals a year and hamish is yeah. usually involved with more than four deals every single month and yeah. he's been with us for 18 months and I shoved him into the deep end of the pool. Uh, Quite literally. He joined. And so we are, uh, we are, we, he has a lot of experience. He's being very humble uh, given the amount of deal flow that we do at the company and uh, his direct involvement and knowledge from the beginning stages of working with a buyer or seller all the way to closing. Um, you are very proficient and, and becoming rapidly educated at a far faster pace than, most agents just by nature of your role at house Einstein and, and Hamish also leads a lot of our marketing effort. Mm. He's behind the camera for our videos and he kills it. Uh, we are very Thank grateful you. to have him on the team. Privilege to be here. Absolutely. Okay. So that's bios. Let's now jump into the market and we'll be kind of brief because market conditions change. By the time you hear this podcast weeks after it's recorded, this information is no longer relevant. And I keep bringing this up because what often happens in, well, there's a term. In the investment community, there's information and then there's actionable information. And actionable information has an expiration date. And the faster you put this information to use, the more valuable it usually is in the capital markets. But that's also true on a slower time scale when it comes to real estate. Real estate allows you the opportunity to get ahead because it moves much slower. There's not digital trading, uh, instantaneous computerized trading of real estate assets on the ground, although ownership maybe someday will trade that fast. Thank God that's scary to think about. <laughs> but um, for now, individuals, as well as institutional investors, as well individuals looking for their primary home or selling their primary home, have time in most cases to get ahead of major trends, to get ahead of local factors. And um, that's Make why market decisions. conditions are, yeah, to make a smarter real estate decision. That's our mission at House Einstein. But the the time period from when you hear this to when it, when the expiration date of its actionability is uh, is relatively short. So by the time you hear this, it may no longer no longer be relevant, and it almost certainly isn't uh, as relevant as you think when it comes down to street level real estate uh, decisions. Neighborhood However, factors are huge. Yeah. I would like to say um, we're recording this right between September to October. When this comes out and you're listening, let us know how we did. Um, you know, in the comments, let us know kind of how it pans out, right? Because we're going to, I don't believe we'll be making intense predictions or anything of the sort, but we're going to be discussing the market. So I'm curious to see, you know, how it shakes. We, we welcome your feedback, um, yeah. your comments, your feedback. And thank you so much for people that have personally commented how much they found this, uh, this podcast to be useful, including some of our colleagues at other brokerages that have reached out to us and, and shared that this is fantastic training. I'm really grateful that you found it useful. And um, if you have at least three years of experience uh, and you really feel like you've gotten an alignment with our mission, you can reach out to me. We're not actively looking for additional people to join our brokerage, but um, if it's a compelling fit with the rest of the team, we're open to it. Um, our mission is not to become uh, the next compass with thousands of agents and a shiny wrapper. Uh, we are much we're more like a box. boutique. Yeah, we're much yeah. more like a boutique investment firm, and we're likely going to move more in that direction in coming years and start to do less 
individual brokerage. But for now, brokerage is our primary business and we make our living by working with buyers and sellers um, and doing real estate transactions. So I'm just gonna look at the data really quick so I make sure I have this accurate, Hamish. Um, but in short, what's happening in the market? Well, we're seeing a pileup of inventory. Inventory is increasing at dramatically higher rates. Normally, there is a seasonal lull. So September through the end of November is a excellent time to negotiate a great deal on a listing that's been on the market for a while. I have always acquired my best personal investments in the fourth quarter, uh, early fourth quarter typically, and close before Christmas if you, uh, or the holidays, I should say. If you don't do that, if you extend the deal into next year, there better be a really compelling reason like a tax advantage to doing so to the seller. Um, otherwise, sellers right around middle of December, maybe early December, they often take their listings off the market and they're less likely to negotiate with you because they are thinking about all the buyers coming in the market next January. And that's typically when the market starts to wake up again. There's a big jump at, right in the first week of the year, and then it cools, and then it starts to build again in mid-February. So the early birds go out right away, and there might be some deals there that are an opportunity. There might be good listings that appear um, by people that are prepared, have done their work. So that's often what you see is really good listings in January. And then mm. those people that haven't done the work in the fourth quarter to prep their listings for sale uh, start to appear mid to late February, early early March, because um, it takes often a month or longer to properly prepare your home for sale. So that's a normal seasonal pattern. The, the market breathes. It's like a heartbeat. Um, we have a peak every year during early summer, and we have the slowest time period in November and December. And depending whether you're a buyer or seller, you may want to consider how to use that information up, up to opportunistically. And mm. this year, due to record high interest rates, 20 plus year high interest rates, high mortgage rates, um, well, it's having a predictable effect at all price points. And if your agent's telling you it isn't, they either are intentionally telling you misinformation or they just don't know. And I like to think they just don't know. Um, they don't know how to pull the data down. They don't know how to do the analysis. It's not their forte. They rely on information provided by their brokerage, which more often than not is really just focused on that individual brokerage's performance and not mm -hmm. focused on the actual market. But when you look at, for example, homes for sale in the city of Boulder only, and you should do this analysis, by the way, for um, your particular city and your particular neighborhood, it's not enough to drill down just to the city level. Uh, we had a client this week that was interested in a listing in Spring Valley, and we sent them some comps to try to start ana analyzing Spring Valley. And their first reaction was, why are we only looking at Spring Valley? And the reason, that's, and that's a subdivision and neighborhood here in Boulder. And the reason is that that is as granular as you really should get. Um, for this particular neighborhood. For other subdivisions, you might even get down to the street level because some, some uh, so for example, like in a golf course neighborhood, there's a radical difference between the homes that are backing to the golf course and those that are not. Um, here in Boulder, there's a little peninsula, Alpine Balsam, I like to call it. And there's an inboard side that has no views. And then there's a north-south outboard side. And the difference in the market for those two different sides is as different as night and day. And maybe oh. an appraiser won't note that for you when you're trying to refinance your house. But if you're trying to make a smart decision, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's blatantly obvious when you look at these homes um, that you need to analyze things right down to the street level. But we're not talking about the city of Boulder. So as of last month, so this is August data, inventory was up 40%. And I don't mean 40% from the previous month. I mean 40% year over year, which is the relevant... Um, metric. Now you should look back and Hamish, you brought this up a little earlier. Why are we only mm. looking at year over year? The market's been really nutty since 2020. And that's a very, oh, nutty wasn't the word you used. We, you, you said, <laughs> we saw a lot of activity, Turbulent. a lot of frenzy, a frenzy. lot of bidding wars, um, record low interest rates initially, and then ended up with record high interest rates uh, in the post COVID era. Although COVID isn't really over, but that's not this podcast. Um, that's a, for a different podcast. Uh, so you should, you may want to even look back to how the market was behaving, for example, in uh, the fall of 2019, which some people have described as like the last normal year. Um, so in the fall of in September 2019, for example, we had 412 listings on the market. So think about that for a second. 
Um, that was what many people considered a more normal year. And we are still below that. Uh, mm-hmm. Currently, uh, as of, as of um, so August data really is what we're looking at. 431 listings in August 2019 and 412 listings in September. There was actually a drop between August and September that year. Normally, it, uh, well, people start taking things off. So this year, 371 in August. And when we do um, September, it's likely to have gone up a little further because sales are also down. Sales volume in August for the city of Boulder, combined, attached, and detached, that's an important point too, is down 22%. For houses only, it's down 26.5% year over year. And that's, again, year over year is very relevant for a market that exhibits seasonality. And so Mm -hmm. when you hear people talk about, hey, last month, the difference between last month and this month, it's far less important than the year over year number. And then the bigger picture is, of course, well, what's happening in the market for your price range, the locations you really want to shop in, um, or if you're selling, what's happening with your competitor homes. And you cannot look at what happened in July and think your listing in September is in the same market. It's not. Yeah. So You need to take into account seasonality. I think that's a really important point to bring up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So from the bottom, right, when the market was at its peak frenzy to today, there's absolutely a slowing happening in the city of Boulder. However, relative to the pre-COVID era, it's actually not a significant slowing at all. And buyers Mm -hmm. should take that into account. Of course, there's huge differences in price range. The entry level and mid end of the market is much more sensitive to rates. The higher end they're looking at their stock portfolio and saying, uh, we're up 12% year over year. We're not paying cash. Maybe we should take the money out of the stock market and put it into a real estate asset that traditionally is anti inf- is inflation hedged. Now, mm-hmm. some people have said hasn't really been inflation hedged, but I beg to differ. I think real estate since this inflationary period began has held its own reasonably well. Yeah. What about prices? What about prices? So last piece, Hamish, and then we're going to get off of market conditions because we have a lot of things to talk about today. But sale prices in the city of Boulder for both property types together, the median sale price is down 20% from a year ago. But the median for one month is not particularly relevant. It bounces all over the place because the city of Boulder is such a small place. Let's look at the median. And you can't see. Maybe I should have shared screen. Um well, it doesn't matter. We're just going to keep going through the data. The median for August in, for a detached single family house was just under 1.3 in the city of Boulder, which is a decrease of 3.9%. And that follows a year over year decrease. Last month, uh, the preceding month, there was also a decrease. So we're likely going to see three months in a row of price declines, which that's when I start to say it, it's sort of, I mean, I took this from, you know, the declaration of when a recession occurs because our numbers are and is our sample size is so small with the city. I like to see at least three months before I'm going to declare a trend. But you can mm-hmm. also end run around that by looking at county statistics, which is a lot more volume. And um, in the county, prices are off 4.8 percent for detached single family houses year over year and for attached townhomes and condos. Prices are down 7.6% year over year. So prices have been falling. Inventory has been rising. And uh, because we represent both buyers and sellers, I can tell you buyers have been much more aggressive with low offers and willing to walk away if they don't get their number. Uh, And sellers, including ours, have had to adjust to the new reality with lower prices and more aggressive marketing like we are well they're not doing the adjustment we're doing the more aggressive marketing (laughs) um we're 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 not just uh prepping it before the listing and pressing the go button we're going to come back and revisit it for price declines as we just did for one of our listings that the seller agreed to a significant price adjustment and you know what we're going to market that we want uh the community to know this is now even it was a fantastic house before it's even better at this current price um Mm -hmm. will it fall further i don't think so but we'll see Um, it's difficult to say some, there's a mix in what you'll find on the market. There's homes that are frankly horrible and dated and, you know, 30 years old, 40 years old, sometimes 50 years old and have been cosmetically updated, uh, on the inside, but they still feature the designs of the 1970s, which, or the early 1980s, which have low ceilings, small windows, 
not necessarily framed around a view, poor energy efficiency standards versus modern homes that are much more aesthetically pleasing, better designs, more functional closet spaces designed around the way people live today. And mm -hmm. also that feature amazing views that were like built around views. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's like comparing a 1970s car to a you know 2020s BMW. Oh. It, it's like night and day difference in, in quality and, and performance. Energy efficiency too. So Right. Um, Construction okay. materials, the works. All right. So why is why is all that relevant? Well, had a, we, I had an interesting experience. So we've talked about market conditions. Let's move on to pricing a listing. And this experience was in working with a client um, who we represented in the past that are, the, that are getting ready to put their home on the market. And right before we go active, well, we haven't actually prepped, right before we start to begin our hard work in preparing this home on our end, the marketing side, uh, mm. they got a visit by one of our colleague competitors who used, uh, well, who's told them what they wanted to hear. And unfortunately, that was we could sell your home for a much higher price than what Osmond says the home's market value might be. And here's why it's an algorithm. And we specialize in this type of home. And uh, we really know what we're doing. And look at this pretty chart that shows you the data. And um, well, they chose to give it a try. And I don't blame them. It's a business decision. Um, it's it's a challenging one for some reasons, uh, but at the same time, it's a business decision that involves hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it also caused me to look really closely at the comps because of what this other agent said the home is worth. And How many times um, have you ran them at this point? I've run them three times since, <laughs> yeah. since uh, I found out we're not getting the listing just because I couldn't believe she's pricing this home this high. And I actually, because these people are friends and I really want them to be successful, I hope she's right. Uh, yeah. But I have the the numbers don't pencil out at all. Um, even when I look at uh, the the design premium she's putting on the home, I mm. really hope I'm wrong. But I've gone through it enough times. We looked at everything that is remotely comparable that is sold since January, um, and there's a number of local factors that just that just doesn't add up. So when I used to work in the investment community, and we were trying to pitch a deal. Uh, it was kind of funny because the deal team would would joke about the dumb money, right? Like initially, you would go on the market hoping for the dumb money. Uh, mm -hmm. The people that didn't do thorough due diligence, that weren't obsessed with the comps, that that really just had to just have this deal and it. yeah, went for it without doing their homework. I was listening to a podcast today, and they were talking about uh, peak frenzy before the global financial crisis and uh, private equity funds and. Uh, how people literally were were wiring money before they got term sheets <laughs> to get in on the on the action, right? That's wow. how insane it was. They were they were like, we just need your bank routing and account info, and then they would wire money. And these these firms were getting money without any due diligence being done. And I, I that actually repeated. So I heard that story was about pre global financial crisis, two thousand whatever six seven. And this story is about current time, like two years ago. Uh, there's a colleague friend who's in the crypto space and was working with a fund and they were seeing the same thing. Really? Money being wired to get in on this crypto fund before or crypto investment, crypto company, the startup. I think it was a crypto startup before any term sheets had been discussed without any due diligence. People were wiring hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in. And I mean, now hearing it twice at two different time periods, right below before the collapse of both of these spaces, it's in my mind, if you hear these stories of money being wired before due diligence is even remotely being conducted, it's a red flag yeah. and you probably should get out. <laughs> that's, your, that's your signal to conduct due diligence. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's your signal to pause yeah. uh, and go slow when everyone else is going fast and maybe you'll miss out on some opportunities, but boy. Um, so we, we used to jokingly call that the dumb money. So it's possible, right? And I'm not saying that this home isn't worth it. It's really going to come down to what's the design premium. And that's a challenging one. And I ran into this a few years ago where there was a home that was on the market by a very well-known architect, the most well-known architect, Charles Hartling here in Boulder. And my clients asked me to run the comps. And I ran the comps and my answer was, 
we are at least a million dollars apart in where I'm ending up based on rational pricing and what the listing agent and seller think the home is worth. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how much of a premium to put on the Hartling name because that name is so well known in Boulder. And it, he has or did produce amazing designs, but some of them are actually quite dysfunctional and have major repair and maintenance issues. Um, some of them are, are completely dysfunctional from a modern design aesthetic. But because that nameplate's on it, it may not matter at all. And it could right. completely be worth a million. And I'm struggling with how to advise you on art and the value of, frankly, art. And that's how some modern homes look and feel. They are truly, there should be a premium for art, but what is that premium? And can it override other issues like view quality, lot size, functionality in terms of square, square footage, bedrooms and baths, garage spaces, proximity to town? Um, all of those factors come into play with valuation. Art, art is an important one to consider and talk about and, and, and discuss, but it's, yeah. I just, you know, you brought up earlier this algorithm and I don't know if there's just an algorithm out there so comprehensive unless there's, unless you have dedicated developers to put together this algorithm and the budget for that, you know, there's so many nuances to real estate. It genuinely needs a person on the, on the property to value it. Well, even Zillow that has spent a, an enormous amount of money and likely in the millions to work on their pricing algorithm admits to a huge error rate, like something yeah. on the order of 9% is what you should expect the error to be. And we, when we've priced our listings and looked at it compared to Zillow, it's often a lot more than 9%. And usually we are higher than Zillow. And so I think at some point, if the AI gets so smart that you can press a button that says this is what your house is worth and they're right, then it'll put us out of a job. But I suspect that, well, maybe it won't entirely put us out of a job, but it definitely will take away a huge piece of the value add we offer. Because when we're pricing a home, it's not an algorithm. It's a detailed analysis of what sold during a relevant time period in comparable property types what was withdrawn and expired, which is also important information, and what is currently a competitor. And yeah. how does this home line up in the spectrum of choices? And then go see these listings. We can't, you can't do that by just putting it on the MLS or by just reviewing the MLS. You have to actually go and see these listings. Well, and how do you wait? certain improvements over other improvements between different properties too, right? Is a very important factor. And that's what you're saying with the Hartling home. Is an AI going to know that in the specific community of Boulder, Hartling carries a bit of weight, you know, like there's a lot of nuance and uh, some arbitrary things that require the intuition of an agent and the experience of an agent to price on correctly. In my well, opinion. And and yeah. the willingness to walk in. So the MLS is full of lies. And what you see in the photos and videos does not reflect what you will see when you walk in the door. At best, it's a, it's, it's a sales tactic, right? It's, it's a marketing ploy to get you to come see the house. That's what listing photos and video and details are designed to do, to encourage you to come look at the listing. And when you mm -hmm. do that enough times, you very, real, very quickly realize there's a huge gap between what you think this house is going to be and then what it usually presents like. And I, I love it when I'm pleasantly surprised to the upside. This home looks better than the photos. But yeah. typically, our clients say things like, wow, this home looks nothing like the photos. Like it doesn't yeah. feel like the photos. And what's that weird fish smell in the basement? And holy cow, look at that cracked foundation. And it doesn't show the church parking lot across the street. And the dumpster that is parked directly across from your driveway that's going to bang open and closed on Sunday. And yep. the traffic that's going to come in and out. I know we this house. <laughs> we know this house, right? <laughs> yeah. There was there was another. This is one of our listings where we were ready to price below what we felt was the key competitor until I saw it. And when I saw it, I realized that's absolutely wrong. This kitchen is lipstick on a pig. It's really cheaply done, and more importantly, the entryway to this home is really cramped and tight, and you can't park on the street. So it has a very short driveway, which doesn't even fit a car. And your guests like, no, there, people will buy this house, but it actually is worth less than our listing. 
Mm-hmm. And we ended up increasing our list price by either 50 or 100,000 on the basis of that showing. And we often invite our clients to consider coming along, but that what you're paying for is for me to go look and me to advise. And at the last minute, the day we're about to go active, we bumped it up 100 and we got it because that was, all the buyers are going to go do what we're doing. They're going to go look at the competition. Is this the one we got it? And I think even before it closed, the market immediately, like we wouldn't have gotten it. No, the market. Oh, okay. it, it had. Yeah, no, that's right. Hamish, the yeah. market was changing Shifted so quickly right then. Uh, that those people got lucky. Well, I don't know if it's entirely luck. They chose us. I feel like we worked our tail off for them, mm-hmm. but market timing, they were in the summer uh, early summer, and that is a much more forgiving time period to misprice a listing. So that that also weighed into our recommendation to increase the list price. They also did all of our recommendations down to the T for staging and prepping that home. Um, and so the home was ready. It was just the final pricing. And um, if you're going to test the market with a higher price, it's far better to do that in the spring, maybe even into the very early first, second third week of summer. And that's it. That's the end of that window for let's test the market with pricing in a normal year. But this year, even more risky. And the fall is not the time to test the market with pricing. Um, mm-hmm. It is time to be judicious and accurate and maybe Realistic. even a little on the aggressive side. So the market's yeah. dropping. And one of the theories out there is you always price ahead of the curve. So if right. the market's rapidly appreciating, you price higher than the most recent comps. If the market is dropping like it is right now, you price below the most recent comps and below the active competitors if you want to sell your house. Uh, yeah, if you they, don't do that, <laughs> good. Right, well, I mean, look, it could be. I mean, there, you have to also really understand how this home presents to buyers. And some homes have things that are very difficult to put a number on. And that's one of the reasons you hire an agent to help you think through that process. Like what is the additional quality when you walk into one of our listings um, on the one on South Peak right now? Mm. It is so hard to accurately describe the feeling you get when you walk out onto that deck and you realize this entire home Even is driving framed around a view. Even driving up, the views yeah. start to like blow you away. And then you get onto this perch and you're like, this home is designed to entertain with this view drop. You're living in this, like you will bring the outside mountains of Colorado into your front door for this view. And, and then if your agent is smart or they've read the listing description, they should start telling you about passive solar. They mm-hmm. should start telling you about the advantages of the orientation of the house and the overhang and the reason why the concrete floor is, is, a, is a reddish color. That is passive solar 101. And this home is going to have very low energy, uh, energy bills because of the passive yeah. solar, the active solar, and the, and the solar hot water, um, the solar PV and the solar hot water. So anyway, uh, I, we're digressing a little bit about one of our listings. Um, but we went to so many showings before we, we advised our client on a price point. And now we've been tracking the market. Uh, the sellers have cut the price because the market has changed. And we have also visited a whole bunch of those competitors. And I've been watching who's been visiting our house because we track our showings. And of all of our competitors, there's only one person who scheduled a showing. Yeah. I, which blows my mind because new listings have come and gone and, and had seen big price decri- decreases. Many are still on the market. And so few of those agents actually took the time to schedule a showing. Um, I mean, I, I really want my clients to get maximum dollars and minimum hassle. And then they make the call on the final list price within the range we recommend. But at the end of the day, I, I, I underpricing dramatically leaves money on the table. And so does overpricing dramatically. So... And it also increases misery because you'll be on the market for a long time. (laughs) Have you seen an instance where it's so cheap it raises a red flag, even though it's totally fine? Oh, yeah. Where the house is just incredibly, yeah. Every time there's a listing that is uh, what appears to be underpriced to the low side, I get a message from one of our past clients who's a really smart person. He now messages me on WhatsApp so you don't see these messages. And he sends me the Zillow (laughs) link and the question is, what's up? And I look it up and inevitably (laughs) it's like estate sale, sold as is, structural engineering report available, house has major problems, was a cracked den, cooked meth. (laughs) 
buy it at your own risk. Like that's the kind of disclosure you start reading. And it's like, mm-hmm. hmm, so uh, there is something. There, yeah. <laughs> there's a reason this home is priced so low. And that is to attract the wholesalers. That is to attract the bargain buyers. Um, and they want to sell it fast and get a, maybe get in a little bidding war that'll take away any contingencies. That's the reason it's priced so low. It's a, it's not a horrible strategy. It gets the house sold, but it usually sells. It's usually better to actually fix the issues with the house if you can. Um, at least the ones that have the engineering letter are trying to help the buyer do due diligence. Because if you don't do that, you, every piece of risk has a price relationship. Mm-hmm. And the additional risk you create for buyers by not providing the structural report, you know, the, the, the $1,500 letter can cost you $15,000 or $50,000. Income inspection. Yeah. So um, take home lesson from all of that is just beware of people who tell you what you want to hear. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. Maybe they're right. And maybe they're. We, we, we talk kind of buyer psychology a lot, but like, of course you're going to hear high price and go, Ooh, sounds good. You know, I, I want the person that's going to get me the most money, but it's, I think, and, and we want to get you the most money too, but I guess the way we approach it is we want to get you the most money realistically and not say, you know, we can just, I'm chopping my words here. You might want to take the lead again. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, as old, it's, it's as old as the earth in sales, as far as sales go. It's old as dirt, I should say, uh, to tell the seller what they want to hear in order to get their business and they're locked into a listing agreement. And then mm-hmm. they bear the, the penalty of overpricing and long listing periods of maintaining the home, keeping it in showing condition, paying for the staging, paying for their mortgage much longer than they should have. And you have a year long agreement with them. So after two months, you can show them the feedback. You, you, if they've solicited feedback, you could also just say, I've talked to agents and yeah, it's just, pre- you know, the market's just changed. We just got to cut the price now really aggressive and they hate you, but they can't get out of the relationship with you at that point. Yeah. So, so beware a particular, there's a, there's look, real estate is a very interesting business. 80% of the deals are done by about 20 to 25% of the agents. It does follow close to the 80, 20 rule. And some of those people in the top 20% have massive egos and they don't listen very well. Um, and they are strategically focused on their own interests. I don't know what else to tell you. They, they, and they know what's going to happen. Um, they, and they're sort of spitballing the price or they're, they're throwing a Hail Mary on price and they're sell- telling you what you want to hear. Um, but the reality is in a market that's doing what it's doing now, it's probably an approach that's going to cost you a lot of time, a lot of aggravation. Um, and you can't get out of these agreements with people because they overpriced the listing. That's, uh, and so keep that in mind. Um, ask when you're, when you're interviewing agents, don't just go with the agent that offers you the highest price. But ask them, more importantly, how do they price the listing? Mm -hmm. It's not what price they think they can sell it for. Because (laughs) honestly, they don't know until they've done the work. And until the day before you go live, you should be having discussions around pricing. And it can change by as much as $100,000 or more, a huge number in our experience by visiting the competition. And there's no way to do that with an algorithm. So the... Right answer is not who gives me the highest price and the lowest commission structure. The right answer, in my opinion, for choosing a listing agent is choose one that does the work and has an intelligent approach to pricing that makes sense. And if it involves pushing a button on an algorithm that then spits out a number, I would be very careful, especially if that number is what you really wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, and again, for our friends and clients, I hope, I hope I'm wrong. And it's possible. Of course we do. Of course we do, right? Like, I hope I'm wrong because I really yeah. want them, even though they're no longer, we're not listing this home, I really hope they get every dollar of uh, that home's value and more. Um, and it's you know, it's possible there's a buyer that flies in from New York, falls in love with it, doesn't care about the comps, is sitting on $100 million of, of net worth and the difference in to get the house they want. Who cares pennies, about 350? Yeah. They might get that. Yeah. That's also who we refer to as the dumb money in the investment community. They're out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it happens every year. There's a listing right now and that we talked about this spring um, in uh, um, holiday that mm-hmm. uh, the mm-hmm. same client sent me on WhatsApp because now it's dropped 150. And it was one that they overpaid like 400 in a bidding war. 
And oh. now that they put it back on the market within you know, a couple of months and or within a year, and they're just trying I, to get I their money back, one. and they're they're not getting it back. They overpaid yeah. in the bidding war, um, and then they went right back to market, and they're already 150 below what they paid for it. Uh, maybe not we'll talk about that if I have time to write about and, it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the work and listing, the emotional roller coaster, which is also something we should talk about. So let's keep moving on our topic list. So we we stay on time. How are we doing? We are 40 minutes in or so. Um, we we are trying to keep these podcasts to about an hour. We don't want to bore you to death. Although so far it sounds like the feedback is good. This is podcast twenty two, so I think we're on a roll. Um, okay, so um, one of the additional questions you really also want to ask in, in, in on top of how do you price a home? Walk me through how you were going to price my home. Is once we're on market, tell me about your feedback systems. How do you get feedback from the buyers that are seeing my house? And at House Einstein, we call every single agent that showed the house because emailed systems don't work. And well, we, let me speak about my personal system because actually I'm not, I'm not, I'm pretty sure Sophie and Ian are doing the same thing. But when I list a home, yeah, 100%, you and I are making those phone calls, Hamish, and are calling. And out of those people, 70% or so return the phone call, even after the second or third call. They just ignore it. And hope mm -hmm. it goes away, which is really bad form in a small real estate community like Boulder. We remember the agents that don't return our phone calls. We have them on a whiteboard, and then we put checks I, next to them. Yeah. I have a naughty list, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just like Santa. <laughs> and one of these days, when you're in a bidding war, and your <laughs> offer is identical to the other agent's offer, your bad behavior might be the reason you didn't get the deal. It's when a factor. often in bidding wars, so many times offers are virtually identical, like they're within you know, 0.05% of value or 0.05% of value, like almost the same price and no difference. Like, okay, Splitting who do you go hairs. with? Yeah. Um, um, no, so, and we've also, even today we talked about adjusting. We're going to begin to um, proactively reach out to agents that are going to be showing listings and yeah. essentially setting a tone and beginning the relationship before it even, you know, begins as it typically would, right? You know, any questions? So I will, I, yeah. I, I will credit one of our colleagues. She's not the first one that's ever done this. The best person who ever did it called before the showing, called during the showing, it started texting me during the showing and saying, point out this feature, point out that feature in case you didn't notice this thing is happening. And this was a high end listing in Colorado Springs. I've never had another agent do that. And then mm -hmm. afterward also called. I think it was her only listing. Okay, and she'd been doing this for a long time, but she understood that engaging the buy side early was beneficial. And more recently, there's an agent in town, I'll name her to credit her, Trisha uh, Dessel, D Diesel, I think that's her, how her name is pronounced. I apologize, Trisha, if I'm mispronouncing your name, but I'm still giving you credit where credit's due because we went and did one of your showings and or what, we showed one of your listings and you called the day before to see if I had questions. And, nice. um, and that reminded me of the importance of not just waiting for the showing. Let's call ahead. Let's turn mm -hmm. on the lights, make sure the home looks good. We do that, but let's also call ahead and check in on whether this buyer's agent has any questions and also to set the expectation that we're going to follow up with this, with a phone call to see what your client thought of the price, what they thought of the home itself. And are there things we could do to improve the presentation of the home? Also, what would it take to bring together an offer with your client uh, to bring a deal together? And that feedback is so much more beneficial. It requires a phone call, a human connection um, in this age of press a button for instant feedback. It requires work and we're not mm -hmm. doing it for every single showing. Well, we, we we're starting to do, we're now doing like now we're like after this yeah. week, last week and Trisha, and I've been thinking about that impact. It's time we add that in. Like we were just making a phone call after the showing. It's time to set the expectation. I'd like that 70% to be 100% of feedback participation. It doesn't feel good presenting feedback to the seller and having voicemail as the, you know, like you've got this agent, they showed on this and I only reached voicemail. So, you know, and every time I go back, I see the voicemails and I'm like, well, I called on a call and I'm not getting anything. So now I'm sending a text and then we're going to go this way. And, um, yeah just <laughs> trying to track these guys down. You know? I mean, part of it is because when, if you don't call shortly after the showing, the agent doesn't remember. Like mm -hmm. I could see 25 houses 
you know, in, in a four day period during the peak of summer, I'm not going to remember every house. But if you called me before the showing and you called me after the showing and then you called me again, I'm going to remember, particularly if you call shortly after the showing, even the mm-hmm. same day. So we were doing these calls weekly. It's time for us to do these calls much faster. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, especially given we don't as have 100 come. listings. Yeah, as they come. Yeah. There's no reason we can't be doing these right away. And so that's our, you know, as a company, our philosophy is how do we keep getting better? Um, and, mm-hmm. and I'd like to think we are a meritocracy where the best ideas rise to the top. And sometimes those ideas come from other, other places and internally. And this idea is sort of a combination of our own creation, the feedback log and calling every single person who shows the home, but now adding in this component of calling in advance. And by the way, very, very, very few agents are doing this. In Super. Fact, uh, most agents aren't even replying to the online email feedback forms. We try to do that, but n- mostly when they call us, we give them feedback mm-hmm. because they've made the effort to actually get feedback. The, the online forms are frankly just garbage. No, they're, you so, know, I've gone on rounds. I think I did like six or nine showings in one day and I brought the MLS sheet with the individual showings and I took little notes for each one that we ran through. So that way when I got home, I could, you know, jot out a bunch of feedback for them remote uh electronically but i don't see anybody else trying to do that you know yep taking feedback is a great way to build relationships with agents and also get feedback on the listings and kind of develop relationships all together it's it's actually a great tool sorry (laughs) yeah i mean there's a lot of things to evaluate your your agent on their online marketing is really important their professional demeanor, their ability to listen deeply, their feedback systems, their advertising approach and distribution beyond the MLS and specifics around that. And I'm from the show me state. And that's why uh, I often laugh at some of these agents that have beautiful videos and no view counts because Mm -hmm. frankly, they're too cheap to pay for boosting on social platforms. So they're making these beautiful videos for who? For you, the seller to feel like they did something. Yeah. And you have a cool video, but in the month, you know, if it sells, then it's not even your house anymore. <laughs> yeah. Who cares about the cool video if it didn't yeah. sell uh, and if it didn't sell for a reasonable price within a reasonable time period. And uh, the whole goal of the video is to put it, the message out there to as many potential buyers as possible beyond what the MLS does. Um, the MLS is still the primary mechanism. That's why the photos have to look so good. That's why the house has to be you know, ready and all the all, and accurate and priced right. But the videos that we produce are seeing you know, 40,000 views in a month. Um, and that's not because it's the our sexiest campaigns, thing. Our yeah. videos are good. It's because we're, we're boosting. We're paying to drive traffic. Mm-hmm. And All right. we're, yeah, we're trying to reach people that uh, might not necessarily be looking for a home, you know, especially some of these com- compelling listings we have. They could be inspiring enough to get somebody to pick up the phone and call, right? So we're and there's a lot of people that yeah. are not actively looking, that are mm-hmm. um, would buy a house if the dream home appeared uh, it's in the back of their minds. They see one of these videos and it does compel them to pick up the phone. I'm mm-hmm. um, actually right as the podcast started, I got a phone call. That's a voice message that <laughs> is interested in one of our listings, not yeah. attached to an agent. Are these people on the MLS? Maybe, but maybe not. Um, so to wrap up this topic, uh, there is a very interesting phenomena with sellers and agent selection. Um, There's also a a roller coaster when it comes to working in the industry as well as um, being a buyer or seller. And for the the client side, um, unfortunately you get locked into a long agreement with somebody who may or may not take their fiduciary responsibility seriously, may not make any effort beyond uh, photography and sticking it on the MLS and wishful thinking pricing. Um, and it really takes a lot of due diligence to know who is competent, ethical, and a hard worker in real estate and who's not. Um, and unfortunately, when you're locked in, you're locked in. So, um, so I, the, I do admit there's also a roller coaster for agents. And the roller coaster for agents after 20 years, it gets easier. But if you're new in the business and you lose a buyer or you lose a seller, there's often a very emotionally charged experience. I've had it myself. And it's no longer quite as traumatic. I look at it as a business decision. Um, and we, uh, if that business decision is made before we've been engaged, there's no harm or foul. Where it really is challenging is when you, you've started working with somebody and that person decides that they're not happy with how they're working 
you're working for them either because you're failing to work hard enough or your values are misaligned or somebody else they feel would be a better fit. At that point, it can be really painful when somebody wants to exit a relationship. And that's one of the reasons we have agency exclusive agreements with people is that it forces us to have that conversation about how Mm -hmm. are we not performing and how do we fix it? Um, But business decisions are business decisions and um, they should be made before you sign an exclusive agreement um, with any agent. But if you are in the real estate game, this is not a game for people with thin skins. This is a game where you are going to be confronted with high paychecks or no paychecks, long periods uh, of inactivity followed by frenzies, be working nights and weekends while your friends are not working and your family wants you at dinner. Like this is a really tough business. It is not for everybody. There's a roller coaster of experience. And if you're getting into it, or even if you've been into it for a while, you, well, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it sometimes you, got, you just got to toughen up. Um, and uh, by the way, that decision to choose somebody else before we began has no impact on our friendships. We do wish these other people really well. Um, and we hope that the money's there for them. I'm, I'm anxious to see if, uh, if the market rewards the design. Yeah. So um, see if this algorithm lives up. Let's see if the algorithm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Enough about that particular topic. Now we've got a couple of more that we wanted to touch on. Mm -hmm. And the next one is title work and surveys. So this is a little bit on the buy side, a little bit on the sell side. And if you're the listing agent, your job is to try to solve, well, buyers and sellers. (laughs) All agents should be trying to solve problems and get out of the way of the transaction. Um, And one of the components of a real estate transaction is title and survey. And this becomes very important in mountain properties, less so in platted property where there's a survey on file and and the pins are known. Even if there's an encroachment, at least you've got a survey on file. Well, um, as most people know, due diligence is not a responsibility of a buyer's agent to their client. So most people that um, are agents, unfortunately, they just become a grand conduit for the information. Um, The title company will send over the commitment the HOA will send over the association docs and they just hand it to the buyer and say, good luck. There you go. Let me know if you have any questions, but they aren't actually allowed to answer the questions or they shouldn't be answering the questions because that's not a duty of a real estate agent to a buyer. In practice, the buyer looks to the agent to explain these things because in theory, we've seen hundreds of title commitments, thousands of title commitments. We've seen lots of HOA docs um, and it's actually a really challenging thing for an agent to manage, particularly one that is believes the, which is most agents do that takes the approach of this is not due, due diligence is 100% the responsibility of a buyer. And I'm not here to help. I'm just here to conduct, hand you the docs and say, good luck. Yeah. Uh, because what I want to do is, is turtle down, you know, turtle up and aim for closing. Cause that's when I get paid and I hope you don't find anything. Yeah, I'm just gonna play. <laughs> I'm just gonna placate you until closing, right. and then we're good. All right. All right. Here are the docs. Good luck, and I hope you missed the email because it's not my problem. I sent you the <laughs> yeah. email. I copied myself. I've got evidence. You got the email. We're good to go. Um, and it's really challenging for me personally to to adopt that sort of philosophy because after 20 years plus the investment background before that. I know a lot about the investment side of real estate. I know a lot about due diligence. I know some of the common solutions and some of the the common problems, some of the things you should definitely walk away from, like mold uh, often, but not always, depending on the the extent and severity and your personal sensitivity. Like this sort of stuff are conversations you should be having with your agent and make sure that they've got alignment with how you would like them to behave. We can't take responsibility for due diligence either. But my commitment to my clients is I'm going to try to help you. Like I'm going to try to understand, like from an association doc's perspective, if you have a dog, I'm going to try to help you avoid buying a house in a dog neighborhood. If I know you have a commercial vehicle or a giant RV, I'm going to tell you up front, if I know that you can't park those in this HOA neighborhood you're thinking about buying in before we get too far down the rabbit hole, because I assume intelligence and you're going to find it. And I want you to find it before we even put it under contract. But not everyone thinks in those terms. And surveys are one of these areas where um, this is usually part of the title commitment review process, although there is a separate section 
just for survey in the contract. Most agents, when they write their offers, just ignore this section because it's so unlikely to be relevant. But for a mountain property, it actually is somewhat relevant. And you should be thinking about and talking to your client about surveys. And we have a recent deal where um, suddenly the lack of a survey or the lack of information needed by title came in. So suddenly it became a title problem and ended up with me calling a bunch of surveyors because they wanted a full-blown survey on this property, which could be thirty to $40,000 and take eight months to get done. Um, and it turned out that none of that was actually necessary, but I had to go to bat. I had to find the information. And actually our, our favorite closer, Jackie, also went to bat. We both went after it to try to get this solved quickly because we don't want to be delaying closing over something like this. And right. it turns out the property was properly subdivided. It turns out that the, the surveyor I called did the subdivision in 1996 and he didn't remember. Small time. But I, I asked him for help and he uh, agreed to help. And we spent a lot of time on the phone and we spent about 30 minutes on the phone, which I'm deeply grateful for, where he walked me through, he reviewed the documents as we went through it. And he showed me where to find them and pulled them down. And at the end of that conversation, his, his comment was, you don't need a survey. All of the information is in these three documents. Send us the title. You'll be fine. And sure enough, all we need is an affidavit from the seller at this point to verify there's been no new construction um, since whatever year. And that solved that problem. And the reason I, that's a topic area is because, and we're only just touching on it, is um, when your buyer's agent tells you to ignore survey, you need to ask why. And th there is legitimate reasons, particularly mm -hmm. if it's in a subdivision in town. But if you're looking at mountain property, beware. And you really should build in additional time into the contract to allow for the resolution of potential survey issues. And really, it's, sometimes it's just at the satisfaction of the buyer. Our mountain house, the one I'm in now, um, there also wasn't a survey. And the expense would have been massive to do a full and proper survey. Uh, and, and so what we ended up doing was two ILCs and taking the aerial maps of the property, overlaying all of them. And my wife and I, Leah and I, sat there uh, with a laptop for about two hours and Photoshop and playing with the layers oh. and making sure we understood what is where. And what, what we discovered very quickly was our propane tank, septic, and driveway are not on our layout. Joy. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't that fun? I'm like, great. We're not buying this house unless we get a permanent easement to have our stuff on this land. And the seller went to bat with the owner of the property where we were encroaching and got permission. Wow. Um, and we got an easement recorded. It was a condition of closing. And it took about two and a half months to close on this property. Um, and the title company was fine with it, which is sort of a surprise. Uh, of course, what they say is they just exclude those things. Right. Like once you disclose the title that you have an encroachment issue, they just write in that's not covered by our title insurance policy <laughs> going forward. Like, great. They just, well, know, we disclose, but... they just want to know. And if you discover it after closing and it's new information, the title insurance may cover it. Um, that's the theory anyway. Yeah. But in this case, we were able to get easements and we solved the issues. It took a long time. And this is me representing myself. So you, I mean, we, we work this hard for our clients too. But uh, when it's important, you got to pick up the phone. You got to do the work. And in the course of three phone calls in about an hour, we had solved that problem, but it required me to stop everything else I'm doing and focus on this issue. So if you are considering buying mountain property, it's okay if you skip the survey, but you should at least have a conversation with your agent about why they're advising that and um, make sure you feel comfortable with that. And honestly, if, an, if a client, if an agent, a buy side or sell side agent doesn't do a lot of business in the mountains, you may want to pause and ask if that's a good idea because there's a lot, whether we're talking about pricing uh, and the differences between Sunshine, Pine Brook, Four Mile, and Sugarloaf, the valuation differences. If they can't walk you through that a little bit, um, you probably are dealing with an agent that doesn't really understand the market very well for these locations. Um, and there's a reason why agents specialize because of that, right? Because it gets so granular. And I mean, you're an exception. I mean, I'll tell you the reason I'm doing as it. You are. Yeah. I'm telling you why, because I find a challenge motivating. Yeah. Right. I don't know why it's innate. <laughs> um, and I love doing property deals in town. And we represent a lot of, actually, most of our deals are in town. Most of my deals are in the city of Boulder. I love representing people in the city of Boulder. But those deals are almost always easier. 
And the challenge, solving the challenge is like putting together a puzzle. And, um, and it feels really good to serve our buyers and our sellers when it isn't an easy deal. Uh, it makes me feel like we earned our commission even more so than in a normal deal. And you can, you can, if you're hiring us, you can expect me to work that hard for any deal, but usually the city ones are less challenging. Um, just, to, just because of the way they are. Yeah. Okay. And honestly, none of this is possible without a team. And I wanted to touch on that as well, because I saw a post by one of our colleagues today who I like a lot, uh, who does a lot of business. And uh, I- I'll mention him, Pat Brown, posted on social media today celebrating his team. And I can't, that, that resonates so strongly uh, for me as well and our team and how grateful I am for the team, because there's no way we could work at the level we work at from the marketing, to the due diligence, to the uh, transaction management, to the follow-ups throughout the listing period. If, if I didn't have you on the team and I didn't have Sophie and Ian as well, and we work so closely together and our values are so tightly aligned to be of service, it's not just a, a tagline that we're trying to help people make smarter decisions. It's yes. what we do. Yeah. And it's so frictionless at this point. You know, it's so good. And that's why I hesitated when I said, you know, if you have three plus years in the business and are looking to join a team, the answer is probably no, you're not a good fit. I just want to prepare that you for that reality. Uh, we don't um, want to create year, this culture of gatekeeping either. You know, uh, well, look, w- my idea of success, and I just shared this with a, with a client uh, this week is not to have a bigger brokerage. Mm-hmm. It's to create more joy, be more of service and live a meaningful and fulfilling life in community where we are of service and value to others, as well as make decent income doing it. And we do make decent income um, and we do do the things that are in line with that statement. And having 100 agents in the team, I think would be a nightmare. Um, I can't manage more than seven relationships at once as a manager, as a leader anyway. So if we got over seven on the team again, we've got a we've got to subdivide and like break into functional groups or city locations. Like it would require more management layers. Mm-hmm. Um, and but is it really worth it? The safe it's, way to do it, right? Imagine if we just tried to take on a hundred agents and we were like not even thinking about subdivide. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> at yeah, least we're the being model smart. Of, yeah. Warehouse of agents all reporting to one employing broker who has no relationship with the agent whatsoever. They're all independent contractors doing what they want. Doesn't trading even liability. Them. Yeah. But paying 20% back into the house, I, it's just crazy. Like, this makes no sense to me. And I'm really happy with our boutique model as a company. But it does have a scalability problem. And that mm-hmm. is something that um, I think has to define, has to redefine what scale means and probably topic for another podcast. But I did just want to end that if you are interviewing agents, um, ask them about their team. Maybe interview with just the team member. I would be completely comfortable with anybody that was thinking about hiring me, Hamish, with scheduling a private interview where I'm not present and the two of you can go talk. I'm totally fine with that. That essentially happened on uh, one of our clients, the buyer that you ran the comps for in the mountains. They called me and I was like, well, I'm not Osman, but I'll talk to you. (laughs) And uh, here we are. Here we are. Um, So I think that's a good place to end. If you are thinking about buying or selling in Boulder or anywhere in Colorado, please reach out to us at House Einstein. Um, If we don't serve that market, we can help you find a great agent that does, but likely we do because our footprint is where the vast majority of transactions happen. But we are also now in the mountain towns on four different MLSs, uh, and and that's all to help serve our clients better. You can find us at HouseEinstein.com. And uh, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. I hope you found it entertaining. And we'll see you next time.